welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. Well, you know, one in every 10 women suffer from endometriosis, a complex, lifelong, and often incredibly uncomfortable disease. And unfortunately, many women go years without receiving a proper diagnosis and are left in the dark about ways to manage their condition, even if the diagnosis is made. So whether you're a man or a woman, pay attention. What we're about to share today could help someone you love, or you might even be living with them right now, or it might be you. That's right, my guest today says that there is hope for all women with endometriosis, and that for many, life-altering surgeries and medical procedures may not be the only answer. She's Jessica Merman, a sought-after speaker, host, and women's health advocate. He's also the author of the new book, Know Your Endo, an empowering guide to health and hope with endometriosis. Today, Jessica will share her, her unique story navigating life with endometriosis. She'll also share how diet, movement, and effective stress management can help women across the globe manage their symptoms and take back control of their body. Jessica, it's so great to have you on and great to see you again. I know. I'm so excited to be here. So um, you've actually gone from being on the verge of a hysterectomy to finding ways to manage your symptoms from home. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that's amazing. Um, and <laughs> t tell us a bit about your health journey and why you decided to write the book. Yeah, I, you know, I wasn't diagnosed with endo until I was around 28 or 29 years old. And it's really common with endo, right? Most people, the average time is 10 years for diagnosis, eight doctors for diagnosis. So I wasn't really even searching for the endo diagnosis because I had never even heard the word before. And it wasn't until multiple trips to the emergency room, and now I know I had cysts that had ruptured, that I had an ER doctor say, hey, this might be something else. I'm going to connect you with this doctor. And then that doctor connected me with a gynecologist. And I was finally able to get diagnosed. But a tricky thing is, is and this endo is just because you have a diagnosis, that doesn't mean that you automatically feel better. It's just an answer. And I really went into a pretty dark place after my diagnosis, not because of the diagnosis itself, but because my pain didn't get any better after having that initial surgery. And, you know, I'm sure we'll explore this, but, you know, there's two different types of surgeries for endometriosis. There's ablation and, there ex and there's excision. And I didn't know that there was a difference. And so I was just, I had multiple surgeries, was not getting any better, my doctor gave me hysterectomy and hormone therapy as a solution. And I was going to get the hysterectomy before a friend sent me a link to a website that talked about whole foods, more plants helping manage pain. And I want to be clear that food and movement and all these things that we're going to talk about, it's not going to be able to stop the endo from growing. But the the key to all of my work and for myself is to have more good days than bad because with endo, it can be pretty brutal some days. So let's stop for a second. Uh, you yeah. and I know what endometriosis is. Uh, in fact, believe it or not, I have personally operated on endometriosis as a oh. thoracic surgeon. Wow. Um, I've operated on women who had endometriosis at the top of their lungs, and mm. they actually popped the hole in their lung from their endometriosis, and their wow. lung collapsed. And so, mm -hmm. can you believe it? A, a thoracic surgeon operates on women's endometriosis. But let, let's have you tell everybody listening, what the heck is endometriosis in, in layman's terms, perhaps? Sure. So endometriosis is when the type of tissue that lines your uterus grows on the outs onto the outside of your uterus. So as you mentioned, in some severe cases, it can grow onto someone's lungs. It can grow onto your appendix. Bowels are a huge issue for a lot of people with endo. It grows onto there a lot. And so what's interesting is, is that with endo, 
the hallmark classic symptom that you see everywhere is painful periods. But not everyone with endo has painful periods. In fact, a lot of people that have it on the diaphragm, they're experiencing shoulder pain and breathing issues, and they're not even having painful periods. So I think that definitely lengthens the time of diagnosis because we're having all these other types of symptoms that aren't even connected to or what we don't think is connected to a gynecological disorder. Yeah, I think that's a very good observation. Uh, this is, it's almost, so this is tissue that would normally be stimulated every month by the hormonal cycle to get ready for an egg to implant inside your uterus. But for unfortunate women, uh, this tissue can, you know, if you will, leak outside the uterus and end up in all sorts of crazy places. Uh, right. And yeah, as a general surgeon, I, you're right. We've operated on women where you mentioned it grows up underneath the diaphragm on top of the liver or on top of the stomach, and they present as if they're having a gallbladder attack or mm -hmm. they present with, oh, you've got an ulcer in your stomach or you've got a cancer in your colon. And, you know, as, as general surgeons, we go in there and go, oh, look at that. You know, she's got a hunk of uterine tissue where it's not supposed to be. Uh, yeah. And it, it's, you're right. It's very frustrating. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but it can do so many things to mimic other things that, mm -hmm. as you know, one of my missions is empowering women to get listened to. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those things where women are not listened to. So that's why you got this forum. So what happened? Yeah. So if people kept saying, oh, you know, here's another operation for you. Um, and you finally said, eh, maybe not. Well, I didn't say, and eh, maybe not, because I did not have any faith that anything would help me. When my friend sent me that link to changing my diet, I was pissed off of even attempting a diet change. I thought, I'll try this for a couple of weeks. It's not going to work. I'll just get the hysterectomy anyway. And, you know, at that time, and this is something else that's important to mention that you'll see on top hospital websites that a, a treatment for endometriosis is a hysterectomy. But if you just remove the uterus and you don't actually excise the endo, that's not going to solve the problem because that endo is outside of the uterus. So I'm so, it's one of those sliding door moments where I think if I hadn't just tried it, even tried it in anger to make these changes, I probably would have gotten a hysterectomy and I don't know where I would be right now. I could be in the same amount of pain as I was before. Yeah, you make, you, that makes a good point. Just taking out your uterus, if these little you know, seeds of endometrium are elsewhere, mm -hmm. that's not going to solve the problem. Right. And we that's and that's the issue is there's so much misinformation out there about endometriosis where they're saying a hysterectomy is a treatment. And this is happening in 2021. Doctors are telling patients to get pregnant as a treatment. A baby is not a treatment for <laughs> a condition. It's a very and so there's it's this is why this work is so important to me because I think when we talk about these things, so many people don't understand what the symptoms even are. So 90% of people with endo experience GI issues. Like if you're having GI issues, you're not going to your gynecologist, you're going to a GI specialist. So it's so important to know these symptoms. And so you can kind of look down this list and say, wow, check, check, check. This might be something that I need to talk to my gynecologist about. So why don't, we, why don't we go with that? You, you and I have both kind of touched on that. What, what, what are the you know, common symptoms that often you know, get, get missed or get misdiagnosed? Right. So painful periods is obviously the classic symptom. Not everyone with endo has painful periods. Painful sex, urinary issues, meaning retention, urgency, frequency, painful bowel movements, uh, painful urination, fatigue. Fatigue is probably one of the biggest ones. And I mention this so often because I want every person with endo to hear this, that 
so many people don't know that fatigue is a symptom and they just think that they're lazy or unmotivated. But when you have that much inflammation in your body, it's going to get fatigued if we're not able to manage that inflammation. Um, for infertility is another huge symptom of endometriosis. A lot of people with endo can have children, but a lot of people that don't experience painful periods, they're not diagnosed with endo until they start having fertility issues. And does anybody know why endometriosis per se can uh, prompt infertility? Are there well, theories? I, yeah, I mean, I definitely explore those in the book. And <laughs> it's interesting because with endometriosis, there's so much that we still don't know. And there's just a lot of theories happening. Like there's five different theories as to why endometriosis happens. And we still just don't know. And I think most of the doctors that I spoke to and interviewed for the book, everyone just believes it could potentially be a multifactorial situation where it's some genetics and some immunity. It's some, we don't know the cause for some of these things. So I do, the book really explores these in depth because <laughs> But it's a weird thing to say in depth because it's also saying we're still not sure. <laughs> gotcha. The diagnosis, uh, number one, is just a starting point. But mm -hmm. why, how do you make the diagnosis? What finally prompts somebody to go looking for this? Well, I think that... <laughs> I think that one, if you're able to be a great advocate for yourself and push and push and push, I think second, if you find a doctor that is really listening to you or even mentions the word endometriosis to you, I get frustrated sometimes because when you go to a gynecologist's office, you have a pamphlet on breast cancer, STDs, ovarian cancer, there is no pamphlet on endometriosis, at least in all the doctor's offices I've been to. And this is happening to one in 10 women. So I think that getting to the point of the diagnosis is one thing. Actually getting that diagnosis is another because it can't be done via blood test, MRI, ultrasound. We have to go inside, look at the inside of your body with the microscope through your belly button and for some, that is not a possibility, whether it's through insurance or time off work. And so getting to the point of the diagnosis is one thing. Getting the diagnosis is another. And then what do you do after that? I, I think that we haven't touched on it yet, but the mental health impact of this is huge. And just receiving the information that you have endo, that comes with so much more than just the physical pain. Gotcha. You, uh, you mentioned uh, in the book about uh, a BBC study, which mm -hmm. I've actually looked up, and mm -hmm. that's, a f uh, that's a fascinating study. So speaking of mental health aspects, uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, so they interviewed over 13 and a half thousand people with endo, and nearly half said that they had had suicidal thoughts. And that is a significant number. And I think, you know, so many people that I've told about that study say, why do you think that is? And I think there's a lot of contributing factors. I think it's waking up and living in chronic pain every day. I think it's not having your pain believed. I think the financial toll of endo can be huge. So I think it's so important, I think, with mental health to get the help you need, ask for help, and to start to develop tools that could potentially calm the issues that you're having. Painful periods. Everybody knows that for many women, um, periods can be painful and, you know, that's a part of life and suck it up, et cetera, et cetera. Take your mydol or whatever. Um, <laughs> how do you differentiate mm. you know, endometriosis pain from... And I, garden variety menstrual pain. Yeah, well, you know, one of the doctors that I interviewed for the book, Dr. Goldstein, who is an endo surgeon, she said to me, it's if Aleve and Motrin and these types of things are not doing anything for you, 
we have an issue. Because I think a lot of people that have painful periods, maybe they even take the holistic route and down a bunch of turmeric and a bunch of anti-inflammatory, but it might help them a little bit. When you have endo, generally with the painful periods, it's knocking you out. And I think, you know, this is without any sort of management practices or a great surgery. But yeah, it's it's debilitating. And I think what's tricky is, is that so many people with endo have a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or a sister that also have endo. So th- those are their period role models. They, I mean, for myself, my mom had terrible period pain. And so I thought, well, that's normal when you have your period. So I went for a very long time thinking that this is what it is. You just have painful periods that might black you out at some point during the day. So yeah, it's significant pain. And I think the fatigue, again, is a huge component of it. I think it's a great point. Um, fan, this does run in families. Um, mm-hmm. That's it not. We don't know if it's, quote, hereditary, but it does, definitely runs. And so you may be, or our listener may be in a situation where, you know, her mother said, oh yeah, you know, every month this is going to be painful and that's the way it is. And, you know, I got through it and you'll get through it. And it's just part of being a woman. Um, Mm -hmm. So where do you just go beyond that and, and seek out, you know, more information? I think by listening to a podcast like this, I think seeing the word and thinking, oh my gosh, maybe it's not normal to not be able to go to work on my period. Going, I remember in high school, I would go home from school the first two days of my period, like clockwork every time. So I I think you can get to a point where you you say, I can't do this every single mom for the rest of my menstrual cycle. That's not a life to live. And I think so many of us with endo, I think we really, really hit rock bottom before we're able to start to dig ourselves out. Yeah. I think another thing you mentioned that I think really does deserve attention, uh, a number of my patients with endometriosis, one of the tipping points for them was uh, painful sex. And oh my gosh, uh, yes, yeah, and that you know, somehow it became they were advised that, well, you know, that's just a part of it, and you know, get over it or live through it, and that's um, not, not what's supposed to happen. And it was actually that that they kept saying, well you know, I want to participate in this part of our relationship, but this is ridiculous. Uh, This is horrible. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So that sex isn't supposed to hurt, right? Right. But you know, what's interesting is not interesting. It's horrible. When I was, when I first started having sex in college, I went to a doctor and I told her that I had painful sex. And this is before I was diagnosed with endo. And she said, I just needed to relax more in bed. So for a very long time until I was diagnosed, I thought it was a prude. I thought I just needed to relax more. There was something wrong with me. And I do think that's a great point. I think that when it comes with endo, we sometimes miss out on so much of our life, like having sex, going to birthday parties, going on vacation, that we get to a point where like, I'm not able to see my friends and family because of this. Like this is, this is interrupting my career, my relationships something has to be done. All right, what do you say to all the skeptics that say, oh, come on, you know, this is all in your head. It, it can't be that bad. Um, you're just uh, hysterical. And I'm sure you've been told this. Definitely. And I, and I always share the story. I interviewed a woman, Lynette, in my book that wasn't diagnosed until she was 53. And at that point, her organs had fused together and they had to take out part of her colon. So this isn't something that's in our heads. This is infiltrating our bodies, creating a lot of pain and discomfort. And like you said, I I also like to reference that it can spread to your lungs and have your lungs collapse. If I think if you were to tell a person, it doesn't have to be a man, this could make your lungs collapse, all of a sudden they're listening because it's not just about periods anymore. So now we know that this isn't just in your head. Um, 
Although, in a way, it gets into your head because yes. this, this anticipation of, mm -hmm. you know, every month, here it comes again. Mm -hmm. So help us, uh, help, help, help our listeners and viewers, how, how do you deal with this from a psychological standpoint? Well, I definitely practice a lot of stress management tools, and those really help me calm my body. And it's not meditating twice a day. I mean, my stress management tools are everything from doing Legos with my son to doing puzzles to taking an edible and watching TV in bed. I mean, there are things that I enjoy that help me calm my body down. Because, you know, in my book, there's a whole stress chapter. And as we know, increased stress can increase pain. So it's so important to me to make myself a priority. And if that means, you know, I have a sauna blanket that I get in every couple of days a week, I really make the time to care for myself. And I think that I didn't do that before. And I think it's hard to do that when you have a career and kids and a family. But if I don't make my stress management a priority, I'm going to be in bed. And I've had to learn that the hard way. So I think stress management is huge for me. Movement is huge for me. And in the movement chapter, I love that chapter so much because moving your body with endo is so important because we're so clenched and hunched and protecting ourselves at all times that we're really tightening up those muscles and joints even more. And that's just increasing our pain. So I'm not out running marathons. I'm jumping on a trampoline. I'm using a foam roller. I'm doing gentle Pilates. And that was a huge mindset shift for me because I think when we look at social media, there's people climbing ropes and flipping tires. And we think that that's what we have to do to move our bodies, but we can do it in a way that works for our body. What about people who say, well, it hurts so much uh, during this time that movement hurts me, so I avoid movement, which... Definitely. I mean, in, in the book, I talk, I'm sure you're familiar with these studies of the pain avoidance model, the fear of pain increasing by moving. And they did a study with people that had a lot of chronic back pain. And by avoiding that movement, we just continue to avoid it because we're afraid that it'll increase our pain. And over time, it actually will increase your pain by avoiding it. So like I said, there are days when I'm in pain and I bring my foam roller in my bed with me and I roll out. I will put my legs and butt up against the wall and I just do whatever I can to move my body in a way that I can do it. And that might just be stretching. And I'm okay with that now. And I, I really have adapted more of a pacing mentality as opposed to this black and white all or nothing. All right. Any other techniques uh, that are important for, you know, the the mental and physical uh, adaptions that you need to do? Yeah, I mean, I also talk a lot in the book about self-compassion and Dr. Kristen Neff, who's really pioneering that work. And to be clear, you know, when I first learned about self-compassion, I thought it was standing in front of the mirror and saying that you're beautiful. But really what self-compassion is, is retraining your brain to say, I'm here to care for you. And her work is so compelling because it's really showing how just waking up and saying, what do you need today? We can really rewire our brain to care for ourselves better. And so I, I do a lot of self-compassion instead of beating myself up because I look very tired or I can't move my body. I say, what do you need right now? And that might be a little bit more blush. It might be my loosest pair of pants. And it has really changed how I take care of myself because beating yourself up doesn't help anything. Sounds like uh, our former uh, senator from Minnesota from Saturday Night Live because <laughs> I'm good enough and <laughs> I, won't, I won't go there. <laughs> but uh, so... You know, can you, you can just look in the mirror and work on this, huh? Well, but to me, it's not looking in the mirror and saying, I'm great. Self-compassion is laying in bed and asking yourself, what do you need right now? And for me, 
the mantras and things like that, they don't really always impact me. So being able to just ask myself what I need and then doing that, that's what's helping me. Okay, so you're a busy mom. Uh, mm-hmm. How do you get through this when your kid needs you and you really don't want to do that? What, where's, the, <laughs> where's the motivating factor? Well, I definitely have a supportive partner, which helps. But I also, you know, and I never put this burden on my son of me having my period, but I also make him very aware of what periods are and when it's happening. And we do something where it's on the first day of my period, we he gets to watch cartoons in bed with me. And it's kind of a fun thing. He'll actually say, did you start your period today? <laughs> because <laughs> it's, it's something now that we get to do together. And so, you know, and I wrote in the book, there's times when he's eating breakfast and I'm laying on the floor foam rolling next to him because it's a way of us still connecting, but still caring for myself. So I think, you know, I, I really have a lot of people that reach out to me a lot that fear parenting with a chronic illness. And, and I understand that. But I think what's so cool is, is that we can also show our kids making yourself a priority and really prioritizing your health. Because if we're able to do that, we're just going to be better parents. And I'm not saying it's always easy, but I find that working those things into our life and sometimes doing them together, it's really been helpful. All right, let's shift gears. Let's talk about food. You know, you and I both (laughs) know the power of food. Uh, So when did you first make the connection between your endometriosis symptoms and your diet? Well, it was that link that my friend sent to me about the power of food and and endometriosis. And there aren't a lot of studies out there to show that there is a link between endo and whole foods or more plant-based foods. But we do have a lot of studies that show lower inflammatory foods can help inflammatory conditions. So I've had pretty prominent doctors tell me that my story is anecdotal and there's no studies to prove it. I don't really need a study. I'm able to get out of bed. I know that changing my diet has changed my entire life. And I think that there's a basic logic to the fact of I have an inflammatory condition and I eat lower inflammatory foods. And it's completely changed my life. And I didn't like doing it in the beginning. It was very, very difficult because my diet was pizza and candy and frozen meals. But I slowly made the transition. And after I did that, there was just no turning back. Yeah, how, how long, once you kind of started this transition, how long did it take for you to notice a difference? I mean, it was pretty quick because, like I said, my diet was candy and soda and frozen meals. So I wasn't going from smoothies to better smoothies. I was at the bottom level of eating healthy. So I definitely noticed a change. And I would say the biggest change for me was just feeling more awake, was just having less fatigue. In the beginning, it didn't necessarily knock out all my cramps, but it made me feel actually alive again and wanting to be able to function Mm -hmm. in the world. So I think it kind of helped mainly with my mental health because I was able to get out of bed, which meant I could move my body again, which meant my depression was a little bit better. It was really a domino effect. But, you know, I'm not even sure how long it took. I just know I instantly felt so much better. And, And I think it's also important to note that, like I said, Food is not going to stop your endo from growing. It is a management tool. I still, even with a great diet and still moving my body, I still have pain sometimes. I just had a giant cyst that they found a couple years ago. But I still am continuing these practices because it helps me get out of bed every day and live my best life with endo. Yeah, that's actually most of my patients with endometriosis um, come to me because either they, they've noticed that 
the plant paradox has worked for them and then they, they want to learn more or they come to me with chronic fatigue and it's actually from their endometriosis and that's how we get into it and oh by the way you know eating a lectin limited diet has made a huge difference for them mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah so i and we see the same thing actually with other chronic inflammation conditions like chronic lyme uh, a lot of us believe that you know, once chronic Lyme sets in, all you're, you're dealing with an inflammatory condition and the reducing inflammation is the key to making that work uh, go away. Right. So you got any fr favorite lectin-free foods or recipes? <sighs> well, know, uh, for those of you who are watching, uh, I think in the Plant Paradox cookbook, uh, several of your rec recipes made a appearance, if I yeah. remember correctly. Well, one of my favorite recipes in your cookbook was it's sauteed greens with coconut milk and a little bit of vinegar. It just really kind of tangy greens. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's one of my favorites that I have at least once a week. So yeah, I mean, I I really keep it pretty simple in terms of how I eat. And I think the, and know your endo, not everything is lectin free, but it's definitely low lectins to, if you're going lectin free, there's definitely swaps that you can make in there. Great. All right. So you say in the book that there's no specific endo diet uh, mm -hmm. that works for everybody, but so how mm -hmm. do you, how do, how do people, you know, figure out what works, what doesn't work? What's, what's your guide? I mean, it's, it's definitely trial and error. I mean, that the title of that chapter is called Good Foods. And the mission of that book is for you to find foods that don't make you feel bad. It's really that simple. I don't want to lay out this is the endo diet that will work for all because I'm sure with your own patients, some people that drink coffee don't feel an impact at all where other people, it completely destroys them. The same thing with eggs. I can't eat eggs. They immediately give me extreme issues where other people are able to eat eggs just fine. So I, I think that what I like to suggest is, is to really get down to the basics of whole foods. Like let's it first start with eliminating the big, I call them the big BIs, the big inflammatories, and then kind of take it from there. Because I think something also that we have to think about is so many people with endo have significant GI issues and SIBO is a huge condition for people with endo. So you might see that garlic is anti-inflammatory, but garlic for you might make you feel worse. So we really have to start to really think about how does this food make me feel? And sometimes we don't necessarily always like the answers. Like I don't like that sugar makes me feel bad. I used to love candy, but I came to terms with the fact that it doesn't make me feel great. And so, you know, last night I actually went to a birthday party. It was outside at my friend's house and everyone is drinking wine and feeling great. But for my endo, alcohol is a no-go for me. And it kind of took me a while to come to terms with that. But last night it felt kind of good to just pop open a sparkling water and just be able to enjoy it without the stress of wanting to drink but know what makes me feel bad. It can take some time to find peace with that. Yeah, uh, good, good point. You've got um, the top 10 tricks to make your grocery shopping less stressful. <laughs> <laughs> what? G give us a few of your top 10 best tricks. Well, I came up with the top 10 pantry ingredients. That's really my goal is to have a list of 10 ingredients that you know if you have in your fridge, you can make a meal in 20 minutes or less. So for me, some of my top 10s are nut butters, um, veggie broth, nutritional yeast, these things that I know if I've got these ingredients and some veggies in the fridge, I can whip something up quick. Because I think that when you're starting to change your diet and you're starting to change other things in your life, you just need to make things simple. Like I, for one, never really cook. So I wasn't starting out with very elaborate 20 ingredient meals. I needed to start very, very basic. And the thing that helped me most was having this top 10 list. So when I got to the grocery store, I didn't feel overwhelmed with all the other things that I could buy. Good advice. Uh, you know, uh, in my first book years ago, Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution, there's some very fascinating research that most people 
end up having five meals that they just rotate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always the same five. You may experiment with a bunch of, bunch of stuff, but most people end up with about five meals that that's basically all they do. And I think yeah. it's actually not something that you should feel bad about. You should say, these, these work for me. Yes. Uh, and you're right, they're usually very easy, uh, which is yeah. half, half the fun part of it. Yeah, so. It's a reason why I don't think I ever want to write another cookbook. It's like, I gave you all my favorites. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> That's right. No, no more questions, right? All right. All right. How did the tools that you talk about in the book, how did implementing those tools change your life? And what have you noticed when other people have implemented those tools? Oh, my gosh. It's... I, I know you get all these emails all the time and you actually are a physician, so you're getting to get the face-to-face -face interaction. But I think that one of the things that I get the most feedback on with these tools is people just sharing that they don't feel as alone and, and understanding that there isn't one exact plan for everyone. Because I think that that we look online and we read so many books that this is this prescriptive, this is the way for all. And I think a lot of people that message me say, I feel seen, I feel heard. And I also feel like I can make choices that feel best for myself. And I think in my own journey, that's what's happened to me. I really thought that I had to do it a certain way, but I feel so much more light and I feel so much more free doing it in my own way and not really caring what anybody else thinks about it. Perfect. Uh, in your book, you talk about celebrating your wins. You know, I think that's really important to do no matter what we're going through. Um, and people know in my office when they reach some little milestone, they get a gold star, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes <laughs> on their forehead, they wear it out. Um, so <laughs> what tips do you have for people to celebrate their wins if you're not going to give them a gold star? <laughs> well, the celebrate your wins, I actually, in the intro of the book, last year pre-COVID, I had a celebrate your wins party at my house. And every person that walked into the door got a stack of post-it notes, and they had to write down a win that they felt proud of. And I think that we sometimes judge ourselves for feeling proud of things that we've accomplished. So I think with Indo. Sometimes it's especially hard to think of our wins when we're in chronic pain. We think, well, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. I think it's so important to think about what can you do. So a win for me, you know, this week is I moved out of my house and it didn't knock me out the way that it might have before because I was implementing my stress management tools while I was doing it, maybe not as much as I'd like to. That was a huge win for me. I, I started on Instagram on Wednesdays, we share an Indo win that people send in. And one of my most favorite ones that someone shared the other week is that she said, instead of working 40 hours a week, I'm now working 36 hours a week. And I'm taking those four hours to care for myself and be with my family. And that's a huge win for her. They don't have to be, I ran a marathon. It can be really simple things that are big to you. All right, so you mentioned Instagram. Where, where, where can women with endo find a sense of community or connect with others to share all about this? Yeah, so I have an account called Know Your Endo, and it's a very, very great community of people. There's also, I also share a lot of other endo accounts. And I think, you know, what I love about Know Your Endo is, is that we do share a lot of information and facts, but we also share those wins that we're talking about. And I think that we need to protect ourselves sometimes when we're looking on Instagram because there's a lot of sadness that comes with Indo. And if you're constantly just seeing accounts that are sharing these devastating statistics and a lot of sadness, it's not always best for the brain. So I, I like that on my account and others that I promote, we have a nice balance. Okay, so uh, go to go to your account on Instagram. What's it called? Just know, know your endo. endo. Okay. Yep, yep. And do you have any other places people can find you? Yeah, you can find me at jessicamernan.com, and I'm also Jessica Mernan on Indo. I mean, Jessica Mernan on Instagram, and then always thinking about Indo. 
And yeah, you can, and then know your endo. You can buy it wherever books are sold. Okay, and please, like we say, please go to your local bookseller if at all possible, because yeah. they've been devastated and they're open now. So go buy there, okay? And I actually have, because I do want people to shop more local, I actually have a signed copy option that you can get at my local bookstore, Blue Bicycle Books. And I, it's so exciting. They had some of the biggest pre-orders that they've ever had for a book. And I think it's offering that signed option is kind of a fun way to get people to shop local. All right. So, can't get a signed option with Amazon. <laughs> uh, no, you can't. Uh, so if you're in the Charleston area, go to Blue Bicycle bus Bookstore. And they have it. There's an online option, too. I have it on my website where you can buy from them online as well. And can they get a signed copy online? Yeah, I went in and I signed hundreds of them, so they're ready to go. All right, you hear, you heard it here first. All right, Jessica, it's great to see you again, and thank you for coming on the show, and good luck with the book. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, it's time for our audience question. This week's questions come from PJ LeBlanc on YouTube, who says, what about cheat meals, cheat days? Let's say I am following your diet, but once every week or two, I would like to eat a good old pizza from the local pizzeria. Will doing so ruin everything or is it acceptable? Well, here's the deal with that. Um, everybody cheats, including yours truly, and I've actually posted from Italy on some of my cheats. I see, oh, 80% of my patients have autoimmune diseases, and that's kind of who ends up with me these days. If you have an autoimmune disease, um, cheating will set you back almost always. It's, and I've documented this on myself. Uh, I can have a weekend cheat and activate markers of my autoimmune disease, and then I clean up my act and a week later they're gone and I can do this at will. Uh, do I want to do this? No, uh, but I do it in the interest of science. Uh, so, and I see this so many times with my autoimmune patients who have gone into remission, they're doing great, and they go, well, I'm fine now, I'm cured, I can relax, I can let down my guard and almost invariably uh, their autoimmune markers come right back up. Many people absolutely positively notice when they cheat, and that oftentimes is what keeps you on the straight and narrow. Um, I'll give you a great story real quick. Um, my wife and I recently moved, and one of our traditions in moving houses is we get to have Mexican food which we usually don't eat, quite frankly. Um, and it's just been a tradition for many, many, many years. Uh, so we decided to have Mexican food. I took, I kid you not, eight of my lectin blocking um, pills before we went. My wife said, oh, I don't need it. Well, needless to say, I did great. My wife, two hours after the Mexican food with her uh, tortilla chips, etc., was in agonizing pain, and I said, don't look at me. Um, you know, what'd you do that for? And so, luckily, these things come back to bite you oftentimes, so I guess that's, if you have an autoimmune disease, please, please, please don't cheat. It's going to bite you. If you don't have an autoimmune disease and you're eating lectin-free, you'll probably notice, for the most part, that you really didn't enjoy that pizza as much as you thought you were going to. And next time, make a cauliflower crust pizza from the Plant Paradox cookbook, and you'll still like your pizza, and it will like you back. Great question. Time for the review of the week. This review comes from Rubber Wilbur on YouTube, who says, I've lost 120 pounds since May of last year on the plant paradox, and I've got 40 more to go. This eating lifestyle is the only thing that has healed me from bed. She has a binge eating disorder. Bed, I like it. I haven't craved junk food in over 12 months now. Wow, that's absolutely amazing. You, uh, Rubber Wilbur, you remind me of uh, a truck driver 
and his wife, they're both truck drivers, who are long haul truck drivers. They live in their truck and they both have collectively lost uh, over 200 pounds on my program. And they're such an inspiration because they literally follow the Plant Paradox program while living on the road in their long haul truck. And they've pulled it off and they come in to see me, they drive their big rig into our parking lot and they come and see me every six months. And so good for you. You can do this no matter what your circumstances are, no matter you know, what um, drove you to eat in the first place. And thank you so much for sending in the review and I really appreciate it. You know, it's reviews like this that help us reach a bigger audience for our transformative health message. So if you haven't already, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And while you're there, feel free to drop in any health questions that you have or let me know of your success. I'll be sure to answer your questions in a future episode. And you know why I'm doing this, because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. We'll see you next week. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Thank you.